I'm going to start now because uh, Mr. McComb, there he is. Oh, no. Oh, but he knew you were coming. Oh, no. How disgusting. I, I'm sorry. All right. I apologize profusely because I know you're never late. How to be a FIT uh, faux pas. Stupid. Okay. Uh, the the uh, important announcements. I hope that you're making notes. I have to tell you no food, no drinks, no cell phone. That, that's a uh, cell phone, uh, I agree. And the rest is from our. Uh, maintenance department and take notes for your final exam okay don't forget listen carefully to our guest speakers uh, and please you're not handing in your five field trips I, i've received very few and we don't want it the last minute because it takes time to enter them uh, okay that's the bad part now we have an announcement theory we're going to arrange a visit to theory for my class, CL112 only. Uh, it's Tuesday, October 20th at 5.30, and 15 students will be uh, allowed to sign up in room A639 starting uh, Wednesday, okay? The list will be ready for you to sign Wednesday. And Thursday, October 22nd, uh, at Theory at 5.30, another 15. It's Tuesday, October 20th, Thursday, October 22nd, 5.30. I'll give you the details. I don't want to take up time of Mr. McComb, who's been tortured by FIT. Okay. Yeah, I know that. All right. I'm going to make a brief introduction, I was going to, and I'll let you tell the rest of your story. Uh, uh, Mr. William McComb, uh, a chief a CEO of Liz Claiborne and a member of the company's board of directors. Uh, Mr. McComb serves on the board of directors of the American Apparel Footwear Association, a very prestigious group in the fashion industry, and the board of trustees of the Pennington School and formerly served on the board of TechnoServe, Business Solutions to R Rural Poverty. I think that's wonderful. And uh, it, he's, he was vice chairman, executive committee, uh, consumer, uh, what is it, healthcare. The H is missing. <laughs> healthcare. Uh, uh, he is, uh, I'll go on. He was born in Columbus, Missouri. Mr. Combe, McComb earned his BA degree in economics from Miami University, Ohio, and MBA in marketing and finance from the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. M Mr. McComb, uh, uh, prior to joining Claiborne, had a illustrious career uh, with Johnson & Johnson uh, for 15 years a brilliant career there. And then he went on to uh, work for, uh, uh, oh, before that, he was with Procter & Gamble through the Lee Burnett Advertising Agency. 
Uh, I'm doing this very briefly because I want to bring you to the podium. And, uh, and Mr. McComb has a wonderful wife and he's the father of three children. I think that's, that's very important to me. Okay, Mr. McComb, we apologize profusely. Okay. Well, I think with yes, yeah. but but you were brilliant last. Oh, okay. you we'll really hit the nail on the head. I think all these students uh, are looking forward to a career. Uh, we have uh, FMM marketing merchandising. Raise your hands high. A fashion design. Raise your hands high. So that uh, it's well rounded, Perfect. and there. I think with your uh, knowledge, I didn't name all the companies Liz Claiborne has, uh, uh, you know, uh, Juicy, yes, you tell them all about, they're brilliant. You could be working for any one of them if you use, you know how to do that, right? And you'll, you'll tell them how to prepare for their future in the industry because we're going, as we've heard over and over again the last several months, economic hard times, jobs are hard. But there's always a way to uh, get in there and be a, a visionary person who knows how. And the rest, I don't want to talk anymore. Is that, is that okay? You You're very well Perfect. Right. Interference, there we go. Yeah, okay. I think if you come in the light, I want to see how handsome you are. Oh, I, I think this is a light enough. Yes? Okay, <laughs> we're good. Perfect. Being, uh, oh, I see. Okay. Well, I'll stand right here. Well, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late. And uh, hello. <laughs> um, I enjoy talking to this class. I've been several times. Uh, Alice has had me over several times. A huge investment in, in the future of our industry. It's great to see so many people investing your time and money for this industry for a career in it. It's an amazing industry. I've only been in it for three years. As Alice said, I uh, came up the, the, the chain in, in management at Johnson & Johnson, which has absolutely nothing to do with this industry, except the position that I came into in the industry as CEO of this big conglomerate, which is a big, complicated, multinational company with a lot of hard moving parts. And I was brought in to do a turnaround of the company because we had bought and bought and bought, acquired, 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 and yet we didn't really have a real strategic direction as a company. And so I've been putting us on a path um, toward real differentiation and focus and really hunkering the company down to actually grow its businesses and, and, and be very strong from a brand perspective. So we shed over 20 different labels, actually 25 labels, and said that we were gonna focus on Juicy Couture, Kate Spade, Lucky Brand Jeans, and in the core, what we call the core partnered brands business, which is the business that we do exclusively with department stores, we have a license with DKNY Jeans. It came time to completely relaunch the Liz Claiborne core business, and that's when we went out and hired Isaac Mizrahi to come in and work with us, recognizing that we had been lacking a true creative visionary on that, on that core business. And other businesses like Kenzie, which is a great uh, young, young women's uh, contemporary brand. Uh, Monet Jewelry is another one. And, uh, and then we have all these geographies to manage. Um, I'm not gonna give you a plug for the company because that's a, that's, a, that's a different speech. This is a conversation really about you, for you and about you. Um, when Alice has asked me in the past, and this is why I like to ask her the question at the beginning, what's the topic you'd like me to, to, to narrow in on? I mean, invariably it comes down to Ultimately, what, what kind of advice do I have for you all? And how does it relate to us in our industry and our business? Um, never minding that times are really tough. They're equally tough everywhere you go. And I mean in all businesses. My friends back at Johnson & Johnson, you'd think that that's a recession-proof, almost counter-cyclical 
business, healthcare, you know what, there are tough times there. It's tough times for companies in the oil industry. It's the automotive industry. It's, you can go all around every sector. It's tough. I'm on the business roundtable in Washington where I sit with a whole group of big, big time CEOs and everybody is basically going through a re-articulation of what they think the normal in their business is and recalibrating, cutting jobs, consolidating functions, moving resources around and trying to figure out how to get back to profit margins that are sustainable. This industry is no exception, but you can't honestly be bothered with that right now. You have to plow through the learning side of this and come out armed for success in what will be a changed but sustaining an ongoing industry. This is first and foremost a creative industry and it really does matter that you have vision, that you are passionate about what you do. I always say if there's one piece of career advice I could and frequently give people is find your passion, success will find you. And maybe you think that, that that passion is fashion, and it probably is. The reality is, that's probably not enough. You, 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 prob it, you probably have to think and go one step further than that as you think about your career. There are many roles and many facets to what you do in this business. And plugging into what your passion is and what you're good at often requires, as you go, an evolution of your own understanding of yourself, self-awareness. It's, it's a journey, it's not an end point. And working through the cognitive dissonance of what you think you are and what you think you like and what you think you're good at versus what you discover along the path. But keeping in mind that you need to be, it's an open quest and you need to be honest with yourself and adjust as you go. I've had people that came to me and said they want to run a business, they want to be a president or CEO and yet they have absolutely no idea what skill set that requires, what that lifestyle is like, or you know, what it requires from a you, you gotta be good at it perspective and comfortable with it. Um, and, and there are lots of examples of that between merchandising and design and supply chain oriented jobs. I think that our business, that the number one call out that I could give you is to unniche yourself. If you're in the merchandising and marketing end of the business, you have to understand the role of sourcing and supply chain and customer as well as design. If you're on the design side of the business, you better figure out how to make yourself a great merchant because being a great designer alone is not enough. It can get you, I could give you lots of examples where there are some incredible designers, but they, 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 there isn't a practical twist to the work that they do. And I, that said, I, I really, what I really believe in is creating organizations that have very strong merchants and very strong designers and creating a productive tension between the two. But the, the key word is a productive tension, not a tension. Um, and I think that the great companies that are out there, when people remark what makes them great, I, I say they're merchant-led but design-driven. And, and there's a twist there. So I look at Urban Outfitters, the corporation, which has the anthropology division as well as the Urban Outfitters division. That's absolutely one of my benchmark companies. I say each of our divisions will get to the point where we're that good. But it, what makes them strong is that they have, running through the center of the company and the culture, is a deep respect and understanding for the consumer. They understand the, the physical requirements of the distribution network, whether it's a, what a store manager needs, or whether in some cases they've got some wholesale business, what the wholesale customer looks like, and they never forget it, and the, it's the merchants that come in and bring that into the organization. And yet they have amazing design, incredible design, and all of it is predicated on a, a proprietary articulation of who their consumer is. And th that's what makes for a great business. Period. End of statement. Increasingly, sourcing is a make you or break you function, and it fits right, it fits right into this discussion. The world of sourcing is actually, and, and production, manufacturing, operations, is going through a lot of change right now. China has become relatively expensive to other emerging markets, and yet when you go to new and emer really new and emerging markets, 
They're real infrastructure problems. Um, it is a very low tech industry, but nonetheless, you've got you've to get people, you've got to have paved roads, there have to be good air and, and sea freight in and out of the place. And these are big challenges that in our companies we all work toward. Um, so, I mean, I, I would tell you that the most important thing as you get into this program is to recognize the criticality of the interdisciplinary nature. Those of you that are comfortably settling deep down into the niche of what your function or major is, you're missing the great value of coming to this fine organization. You, you know, I, I always said, and I, I honestly attribute any success I've had in my career to this notion that I was going to be good at all of it, but a master of one of it. So all those years I ran marketing departments, you know, uh, in their consumer companies at J&J. &J. And then I ended up becoming in, in, into top management. But as I did it, I, it was critical that I understood R&D at a very significant level, operations and supply chain, finance. This is what being a success in a company is all about. I said having a vision is also super, super important. The best people that work for us are people that not only have a vision and are passionate about it and can articulate it, but can take a stand for it. And taking a stand is the personal courage and charisma put together that deliver an, what I'm going to call an executive or artist presence. And, and it matters. It matters in business. I'll tell you what, you don't know it, but every one of you is going to become a salesperson. And what I mean by that is you may not be in a showroom selling product or you know, in, in a studio selling vertical retailers to take a buy, but I mean selling your ideas is something that you start doing the minute you get into business. And understanding today that you need to be a success in business, not, you know, I would say unless you're in your own business alone, but I think of my wife. She, is, she owns a publishing company, a children's book publishing company. Um, she, she is um, she, she's hired by HarperCollins, Addison Wesley, Houghton Mifflin to basically write all their textbooks in English and literature. And so she, it's, it's almost a one-man show. She's got a network of about seven or eight freelancers. But I look at her business and I think, I mean, she's a writer, she's an intellect, she's doing work, you know, alone in this library in her house and has for years and years and years. But I'd say something, she's a salesman. I mean, she has to go out and get contracts. She has to work productively with clients in delivering the goods. She has a network of freelancers. She, it, it doesn't matter what your role is. I guarantee you, you will be a salesperson. So understanding that and respecting it and embracing it and thinking about it in those terms and saying, gee, what is it that will make me successful at my function, even if that's design? It, it, understanding those interpersonal skills are absolutely key. So that's kind of a super wide thesis for you on what I think matters and what the secret sauce of success from a career perspective is. I, like I said, th there's no question that our industry is going through tumult and change and I think there are going to be big things that come out of it. I think there are going to be big secular changes as, as time goes on. But I also know that you can go back and look in the history books and there have been times where, you know, I think we can almost convince ourselves that things are going to go away, there will never be any more jobs, and that's not the case. This is, I mean, the, the interesting thing about our business is the barriers to entry are low um, and new things come along all the time and I think that there will always be a lot of opportunity. So I don't think that, relatively speaking, you, you've, you've, you've jumped into a very dangerous area. I think it's great to be a specialist, and by definition, your work is, and what you're pursuing is a specialization, and I think that that will serve you well. So why don't we do, why don't we do some Q&A, because it'll lead to more interesting conversation. Yeah. I think that, I, so the question was what kind of changes, I mentioned that there will be a lot of changes, what kind of changes? Um, there has, we're coming out of a bubble, it's a bubble that burst. So just like the housing bubble, just like the internet bubble in the early 2000s, there's been a, a, a consumption bubble around the world, meaning that people, consumers have been spending at a multiple of their adjusted gross earnings and, and they've, been, they've been living on credit. And so the number one thing that's going to happen is the use and role of credit in our businesses from a direct-to-consumer perspective is going to change. So the absolute demand pools are going to, they're going to shrink. And so in some businesses like handbags, where we got to this area where 
you know, a loyalist in a given in, in handbags might buy four or five very expensive $800 to $1,500 handbags in a year. That's going to be literally no more than two. She's not going to go out of business. She's not going to leave the category, but she, she's going to still treat herself. She still loves cons consumables. She loves, she's materialistic. She wants the badge to say who she is, but she is going to devote half the amount of money to that. Um, the, va the value orientation of the consumer, I think, will be changed for a long, long time. We all know the stories and hear stories of our grandparents or great-grandparents, maybe in your cases, of, of the Great Depression. I mean, there are elements of that where people will, will, will really be shocked into, uh, I, I, I've said, a, almost a different morality around spending. But what it means when you roll it up in the industry is there are too many retail stores out there. Okay? There are probably too many shopping centers and malls, but too many department stores and too many stores in the middle of the mall. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that certain companies are going to go out of business or not. It's not that simple. But a, 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 a collapsing of the number of retail points of distribution in an, evol in an evolving way, is go it's going to happen. Um, I also think that just the sheer number of brands out there, I mean, you're already seeing it. It's just very quietly you know, listed in WWD, Kenneth Cole isn't going to make this men's business. Juicy Couture, we stopped the men's business. This one is going to get rid of their kids' business. This one is collapsing the sub-brand that they have. I mean, we are all getting serious about more heavily weighting our resources. I am really grateful. I came in in 2006, in November of 2006, and announced in July of 2007 that we were going to get rid of 20 businesses because we couldn't afford to run them. If I hadn't done that then, we'd be out of business today. As a corporation, we'd be gone. That's a fact. So it, it, more of that is going on, uh, a focusing, less new store construction. Um, and, and, and there will be, it, this, is, this is, of course, I'm speaking to an audience that has a lot of true aesthetically oriented people. There will be changes in ideals and fashion in and of itself that just that come with this. I won't make the call on that. You can watch. You can infer. Um, the interesting thing is what's not going to happen. I mean, people tend to swing from one thing to the other. As I said, consumers are still materialistic. Americans are materialistic. They're style-oriented. They want to buy things for themselves. And what does not happen during these tough times, people don't go from a world of wants to needs. There's a mix of wants versus needs that they'll allocate money to. Yeah, they'll spend a little bit more of their money on their needs than their wants, but they're, they, you know, at, at Johnson & Johnson we used to say, why do people complain about a $5 copay for medicine when they spend X amount on cigarettes, X amount on liquor? I don't understand it. This stuff makes them healthy, that stuff makes them sick, that's the consumer. So it, it, they, they're still going to shop. We see our outlet businesses, we're seeing huge comp door growth this year, all year in outlet, while at the same time our specialty store, middle of the mall business, or, or high street, or um, fashion area mall uh, uh, stores, specialty stores, are down between 25 and 30 percent. So you've got that, that, that polarity where they can't buy enough at Juicy or Kate at the outlet, but they're just not making the trip into the full price store, and it's psychological. Well, we, we, our company, you can Google it and research it. We were one of the, we were the first company to start the, the, the human rights labor initiative in this industry. And so it's a huge part of our, for me, an inherited culture that's wonderful and highly compatible and consistent with the J and J credo that I grew up with. It's a huge part of what we do. So anytime we're negotiating with a supplier or qualifying a new vendor, it, we, we have a staff of people that do a qualification and that conduct audits. And that has not changed or waned at all in this environment. It can't. It just can't. And yes, there are really good and really cheap factories that work for some of our biggest competitors that we won't work with because we have not qualified them. In other words, they don't qualify. And it, um, uh, it amazes me, to be honest with you. And that said, you can never catch it all. 
because you don't control it. We don't own the factories. And while we do blind inspection, you know, are we catching 100% of it? You, you never know. But what I do know is that with great diligence, we execute uh, a, a, human, a human labor rights program that's, that's really good. But I do think that this economy stretches that. And there'll be some companies that start turning the other way. You know? It's a worry. In this economy, I would honestly tell you, and I hate to squash any entrepreneurial flair that you might have, but there, in this, this is this is some of the most this is the most treacherous economy of my lifetime. Born in 1962, I'm 46 years old. There's never in that from when the time I was baby. There's never been anything like this. You need to know something. The banks are broke and broken, and the problem is liquidity. It's lending. It's, it's little guys. I mean, I'll tell you something. It's crazy. We just finished building a house. Terrible timing, right? We worked on it for four years. What, what the guys that would show up at our house in the last year would say that they were literally, that they're in a, in a barter position with other trades because none of them have working capital lines. Little small businesses, guys with you know, 12 employees. Um, I would tell you that for that reason alone, you know, get, get some really solid training. Never, ever let the idea of owning your own business and running it leave you. But say to yourself, look, there is this degree, and then there's a, d a degree from the school of hard knocks out there that's the next thing you want to get. And no matter what, you can and will learn by being in an organization. And I would say that, that the sun will shine again on our economy and this industry, and then there will be plenty of programs that you can go and you can jump into. And, and when you go and do something like that, don't do it alone. Everyone needs a partner. Everyone needs a partner. No one's a know-it-all. Everybody needs a little help here and there. But go pick up some learning. Improve your selling skills. Improve your interdisciplinary core-to-core -core, uh, functional knowledge. Make some mistakes. Um, learn from a leader. Get yourself a mentor. Get somebody that really thinks you're great and will give you a crazy chance at something. And set a big goal for yourself. Just because you go to work for a company doesn't mean you can't entrepreneur. I will be honest with you. I was most voted most likely to be an entrepreneur in my MBA class at the University of Chicago. And here I am. I'm a you know, Fortune 500 CEO and have been all the way through you know, the last 15, 16 years. Well, it's very interesting. I have, a, I have found all of my needs fully satisfied inside a company, and yet I'm a bit of a renegade. I'm a bit of, I, I am. I have my own style. I take huge risks. And so this whole idea of entrepreneurship, it, it, it's, an, it's another way to go. But right now, you're talking about the most dangerous and deadly economy out there. I don't even know why you'd want to. I really don't. I would say, wait for the sun to come back up. It will happen. But I've thrown myself into a lot of reading, honestly, about World War II and the Great Depression. And I've done it because there's a lot of leadership lessons and personal stamina lessons to learn. You ought to do that. It's actually fascinating to put ourselves, you know, I mean, this isn't nearly as dire as that, but we, there, there's a lot of direness out there. But it's, I've sourced an awful lot of good mental strength by reading, you know, um, um, chapter and verse from some great biographies from that time. Treacherous time, though. Yes. How does the lifestyle of a CEO look like? Lifestyle of a CEO. You know what? I, I'm, I mean this. First of all, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to lead a, a big company. But I will tell you, it is, a, it is a thankless, hard job. And they pay me a lot of money, which is great. But I have to tell you something. It, not many people would, would make the trade-off for the money what you give up. It, you give up everything. It is, I work seven days a week. I work morning, noon, and night. Um, it, no one ever says thank you to me. No one ever says good job, right? All the shit rolls up to me. And, and it, there's, a, there's a lot of risk. It is, I'm running a turnaround of a tough company in a deadly industry right now. Uh, I mean, it, I, I, am, I had to learn to just be completely humiliated by the newspaper all the time. 
and it happens all the time. Um, crazy rumors that aren't true, you know. Um, it is, a, it is like an existential type existence. And that said, I am very high in needs to lead, and so I am satisfied psychologically on a very important level. Um, and I know I can make a difference in people's lives and in the industry, and that's what I focus on. But it is, it is so, if you're a real CEO, and I'm a, I'm a hard working, work till midnight, write it myself, you know, it, it, is, it is tough, tough, tough work and yet an honor and a privilege. But the lifestyle is, I just don't think people realize how you never stop. You never stop. I mean, there are times when I just say, I just wish I could go to sleep for three hours, just for three hours, you know, during the week. It's, it's the travel, it's incessant. Yeah. What are some of your favorite books? What is oh, some of my favorite books. I read crazy stuff, though. Nothing that will have anything to do with this particular industry. So I just finished a book called The Kennedys, 1937 to 1945. And it's all the inside effect that the war and the depression had on the Kennedy family, each, each and every single one of them. It's a great book. It's a masterpiece. I just finished Arthur Schlesinger's uh, Journals, it's called. And it, it, it recounts his time with six presidents. And it really is a, 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 a piece on the 50s and 60s. This was just before I dove into the Depression and, and World War II. And that was a very interesting, analogous time as well. Um, so I tend, to like, I tend to like those. I'm not going to name popular business books like Outliers or Blink or anything like that. Because the truth is, it's not really how I spend my time reading. But I have a Kindle, and my wife loads it up with books so that when I'm traveling, I can just kind of go through and pick and say, ooh, I'll take that. Thank you. Yeah. This yeah. Really yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about hiring marketing? Do you feel like it's, gonna, like it's an over-contraction that's going on now, which might open up a lot of opportunities for people that are in the market? Or do you think it's going to be well, you know, I, I mean, I, the problem with this economy is that it is a bubble economy. So we, we, we're, we go into these states of extreme disequilibrium. And so, no, I, I don't think that this is going to continue forever or even for very long. But I think that we're in a state right now that will stall for two years. I think that we'll be in a 6 to 10 percent unemployment range and underemployment that looks more like 12 to 13 percent for uh, about another 18 to 24 months. And then I think the economy will really start clicking. I think there are enough fundamentals. Certainly the stimulus is going to have you know, a, a, an effect that we can't even quite predict. Um, but I, I do think that, there is, that, we're in, that we're in a disequilibrium against the supply side in, in the labor market. And, and it'll, it'll pick up after that. And I think you've got to be crafty and hardworking and pragmatic and lower your standards and claw your way into an experience. And, and you can get one. You can. Do you feel like more companies will be diversifying in the next couple years? Like Kate Spade now has a clothing Yeah. This doesn't seem like the right time to do something like that. I feel that more companies will be adding. Yeah, well, they, see, the irony of Kate Spade, I mean, it's the perfect time. It actually has swung us from losses to big gains, and the reason is productivity. So we had 72 stores for Kate Spade, and as a handbag store, it became a real problem in this handbag market. We've subsequently increased the penetration of small leather goods. We added jewelry as a category. We launched apparel, and we haven't increased one, one square inch of square footage to the stores. And what's happening is that for a given base of traffic, the opportunities for conversion are, are going way up as she is, you know, I mean, Glenda Bailey at Harper's Bazaar will tell you that the costume jewelry necklace is the new handbag. And in fact, our business certainly looks that way in all of our businesses. So yes, the idea of in a time like this, what great merchants like you in your future will do is you'll figure out where's consumption. What, what product categories are the cons is the consumer buying? What price points is she looking for? What are the trigger points for purchases or for walking into a store? And you completely re-anchor or re-weight your, uh, your line architecture and your assortment strategy around that. And it, it makes tons of sense to follow the consumer in terms of, like I said, re-weighting product categories in the mix. So, and, and doing it in a way where you're, where you're following the profit. 
So I think there will be more, more diversification from a product category perspective like that. Yeah. The markets outside the U.S. are by and large doing much better than the U.S. Spain is the notable exception to that. Um, but Europe and Asia ha are generally speaking better. Our company is way overweighted in the U.S., which is a real problem. Um, that said, Juicy has big business in the U.K. We are number one women's uh, apparel brand at Harrods. Um, at Harvey Nicks and at Selfridges in London, throughout the UK, and we just opened our first retail store on Bruton Street off Berkeley Square in London. Um, uh, Juicy has a partner called Lane Crawford in Asia, and they have opened 20 retail stores. They will open uh, to a total of 49 over the next two and a half years, um, 30 months. Um, and they're a fantastic partner, and they're aggressive, and the stores are great, and great partner. Kate Spade has a joint venture in Japan that makes up half of the business. It's well established. It's 10 years old, um, and they have 30 stores in the country of Japan alone. Um, that has created a very high level of awareness in other Asian markets, although we, we, we have a partnership based out of Hong Kong for China. We just have a few doors there. Big expansion coming. We're opening Juicy Distribution in South America in Greece, um, and we have a partner for all of the Middle Eastern countries, and a pretty big distribution base on all of the businesses in the Middle East. So the answer is, um, there are a couple of markets that have, that have been, Russia is a disaster, by the way, disaster. Um, Russia and Spain. Our largest international business is a business that, we, that actually has no volume in the US. It's called MEX, M-E-X-X. -X. It's a European banana republic. It is a billion dollars in sales. It's based in Amsterdam. It's in 64 countries, primarily continental Europe. It's not in Spain, it's not in the US, it's not in the UK. It's big in Canada, and it's big in continental Europe and Eastern Europe. And, and that's, a, that's a, like I said, that's a, a, a European pure play. It's a great company. Yes? Thank you. Oh, great. Okay, so her, she, she's joining the fa she's at FIT coming out of financial services, making a career change, and she asked if I had any advice uh, making an industry change. Well, you know, I was I was really blessed at Johnson and Johnson because I, I they moved me around like GE does, J and J does the same thing, different industries. So I was president of the company that makes Tylenol, their largest consumer products company, and then I was president of their largest pharmaceutical company, and then I was the global group chairman for their medical device group, which is all surgical products, orthopedics, neurology. And I have to tell you, those were much harder individually, much harder transitions than my transition into this industry. I think the advice I'll give you relates to making any, any industry change, and that is open wide the eyes and doors to learning what it is that makes the business tick. You, you, those people that, that bring their rubric and their formula from one industry into the other constantly smash up against a wall. You've got to get in and you've got to figure out what makes it all tick. How does it work? Um, and be completely open to what I call unlearning in addition to learning and relearning. So unlearning is literally letting go of the stuff that, that how you wired your head about how the old business works and completely wire it differently for this. If you do that, it, I will tell you it's an easy business. Uh, honestly, I think it's an easy business. I think it's hard in terms of the actual muscle. The execution is unrelenting. It's exhausting. It is, it's a business where you reinvent your entire product line four times a year, sometimes six, sometimes 12. So you're, you, know, you don't ever anniversary anything over again. It's constantly starting over. And we don't have anything like that in our other industries that we've worked in. And, and, but yet it's not, it's not hard in terms of there's not a lot of mystery to it. It's, it's pretty clear in how it works. And uh, I, I also think that supplementing what you get here with a lot of interviews and meeting people that are in the industry and become a collector of anecdotes and stories and advice 
and write it down, look at it, and listen to it. I think that that makes a big difference. And that's really the point of this program. Alice brings to you different voices and different people from the industry, so that it's a very efficient way to sort of collect that stuff. But you listen to it. It's all, it's all in, you know, we all have the same, basically the same set of, of advice with a twist here and a twist there. Write it down and look at it and follow it. But also, you know, blaze a trail. You know, follow your passion. You've done this for a reason. I sense that you, you know, you're you're here because you're in pursuit of your passion. And I do, I will tell you, success will find you. Those people that make a decision and compromise and say, well, I'm going to go work there and do that because I'll get promoted really fast and they'll pay me more money. It, it. I've never taken a job for money ever. There were three times in my career where I took jobs that were huge demotions in title and pay, and every single time. Back it came, bigger, stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that Liz Claiborne um, uh, lacked the vision and that was a problem with this company. Like, how did you uh, get it back into swing and were you involved in like design strategy? No. No. <laughs> um, what was clear to me was there was no point of view. And we, there wasn't a crisp articulation of who the customer was. We were a department store brand, and we were, you know, we were their, you know what? We were their, we were their, their thing to smack around. And they would tell us, and, and, and it was like democratically approached design. We just did whatever the department stores told us to do year after year after year. And after a while, there, there just wasn't any point of view. There was no edge. You know, when it was run by Liz Claiborne, I mean, it was a brand. It held together. You looked at it. There was a point of view. It attracted a certain person. And it got uh, commanded a premium price. We ended up just, I mean, there were lots of problems. We ended up being too much in TJ Maxx, too much at Costco, you know, over-distributed, didn't have a distribution point of view, and didn't have a good solid positioning statement, a solid understanding of who the consumer was, and not even a master creative director that was orchestrating across all the licensees and across all the, 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 the product categories. And so my sense was, in looking at the market research data, that the consumer still had an amazing affection for the brand and that there was one more great play in it. And my approach to go get Isaac was really based on the idea that, that he, he was a true master designer and he had done really well at Target. So he had shown high-low can really work and he understood a mass consumer but had really strong design principles. And I said, I'm going to give this to you and let you do with it whatever you want. You do what you want with the logo. You do what you want with the marketing. You uh, refine and define and be very crisp about the target audience. He did all of those things. Yeah. So it's, it's we're, but we're just getting started with it, to tell you the truth. We're, we're in season three on it. And did you somehow like, um, change your product offering? Oh, completely. Uh, cut down or something? Cut it in half cut down in half. And we're not done. There are more things and more steps and more announcements that we will make related to what we're going to do to just really have that take off. But yes, it, it, everything was touched. Everything. Uh, yeah. Great. I'm glad you mentioned Isaac Mizrahi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The designers have played a very important role in all of our company and all of our divisional turnarounds. I mean, the first thing I actually did was talk about the need to completely reinvigorate design. And now I'm, and now I'm very much focused on merchandising now that we have gotten design to where I think it's really humming in all the departments or companies. Yep, and I brought Tim Gunn in, who runs our Creative Resource Center, which is really a ser an in-house service group to the design community. So he runs our, our fabric trend and color library and forecasting team. Um, and he's got on our fifth floor a huge resource center of, of archives, of, of, of beautiful, yeah, beautiful magazines. Well, actually, not even, yeah, there are some Parsons items there, but, but really it's, it's our company's own collection as well that, that's, that's years old. So he's a great resource for that. Yeah. Do you have any plans in the future of starting a very high-end 
that's sort of what we did with Isaac. You know, we've got Liz & Co. at Penny's, which is a mass brand, and, and we call it Liz Claiborne New York with Isaac, and it's a higher end, but not a super high end. I'll be honest with you. It, no, I, I, we're not. It, the consumer wouldn't go there. She wouldn't. It, we lost that level of design authority to be super high end. To be more premium at the, at the Macy's Plus level, that's really what Isaac's work is doing. So Lord & Taylor, for the first time in 15 years, brought the product back in. And they're expanding the distribution again shortly, uh, I mean, for spring 2010. And that's good, but not real high end. Product brands do have life cycles. And we let it go a little too far, I think. I met with a lot of people very quietly. I cold called people and went to dinner with them and I talked about their business and what their vision was. I was very attracted to the fact that, first of all, Isaac was still at Target when I called him. And I didn't know it, but I happened to call him on a day when his contract was coming due and he and his partner, Marissa, were trying to decide whether they were going to renew or not. I loved that he went already up the learning curve on mass. I didn't want to take a couture designer and try to teach them about the tough design and merchandising pragmatics of the mass market. And I mean, he cut his teeth at Target and, had, and knew and learned a lot. I also liked the fact that Target had made him a household name and that he was a beloved character. I mean, we were looking to repersonify the brand. So it couldn't be somebody that was elusive and behind the you know, cloak of a dark studio. It had to be somebody that was a personality to rebrand the name and re-personify it. And I, honestly, there isn't anyone else that can deliver like Isaac. And, and then, frankly, he did a project. And it, was, it, was, it uh, brought tears to my eyes. His sensibility for the history of Liz, he was proud of it. He remembered it. He wanted to do it right. And I was looking for uh, some archival work. Yeah. I think it's good. You mean, you mean Isaac's? Yes. Um, so the question is, how does Isaac's TV personality affect the business? It definitely does. Um, and I think that's great. I think that what, what this business is about is cultural relevance. And I think to the degree, the degree to which your brand, in, even in a personified form, at, in the form of a creative director or Tim Gunn, I'm, I'm thrilled when every time on Project Runway when they introduced him as the chief creative officer of Liz Claiborne, let me tell you something, that's just right there, that 10 seconds is great for the Liz Claiborne brand, yet alone the identity of the company. And so, and Isaac's edgy, and I think fashion should be edgy, so I'm, this isn't like we're like making baby products or Tylenol again, where I have to be really worried about the reputation. If he, you know, drops the F-bomb on a show and they have to bleep him, I think that's great. And I think it's edgy, and I think it's creative, and I think he's an original and, an auth and authentic. So I think it's good, and, and you know, good and bad comes with it, but I think in this business, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question in the comment. Um, I, well, first of all, I've just been laughing to myself this whole time, because I work for Nordstrom. Oh, good. We actually carry a lot of the vendors that Liz Claiborne owns. I mean, Kenzie, G. Sure. Uh, Kate, yes. G. You're right. Yep. We have a great partnership. Juicy won Vendor of the Year a year ago. I was up there with Blake and Peter and Loretta. It's a great partnership. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, I work in the savvy department. Yeah. The trend department. Yep. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me because I've been hearing a lot, reading a lot about how in a bad economy, this is the first bad economy I've, I've experienced in 25 um, that I can remember. And it's, it's the stuff that people don't really need that tends to do well. And I'm seeing that in my work in the trend department. We're one of the only departments besides like kids where she's and things like that that's showing an increase. Well, let me tell you why that is. Yeah, I'm why Savvy is doing well is that there is a group of women that are 18 to 34 that we call the invincibles. She doesn't own her house, and so she's never cared about her mortgage. Her job is secure because she's right at a place in the ladder that it tends to be secure. She, a lot of those women, your customers, are single or newly married, and they are still big time investing in their personal identity via how they look. 
And so there's this imperviousness. So we call them the invincibles. So our Kenzie business, for example, is, I mean, it's nothing like the women's business. The Missy business, women's sportswear, 34 plus, the women 35 plus, forget about it. Talbot's, Liz Claiborne, Ann Taylor, Jones, New York, those businesses are adrift. They really are because that woman is, she's a head of a household. She has either a baby or a bunch of kids. She's got a husband, she's working. And you know what? She's put herself last on the totem pole in terms of priorities. And, but that's the reason I think specifically why Savvy it, it does well. And you know, it's also why we've invested frankly in Kate Spade right now because our Kate Spade girl is that woman. Same for Juicy Couture. Um, and, and so I'm glad that of the 25 brands that I unloaded, they were all in the women 35 plus sportswear, you know, Ellen Tracy, Dana Buckman, we did something great. We took that out of that dead bridge zone, brit, you know, traditional bridge, and we made it an exclusive brand at Kohl's, and it goes for that girl. It goes, it goes for, it's Tory Burch at Kohl's, and it's, it's great. It's doing really well. I don't know. I mean, I would say we're not. We're not seeing it. There's, there's been what we call a certain level of statistical white noise that's always out there on the radar. We hear it more in denim at Lucky Brand, where, there, where we used to make a big deal about made in Los Angeles. Juicy used to be half the line was made in Los Angeles. And honestly, we're not seeing any more or less of it. it, 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 it and we think that it's, it's a bit of a red herring that 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 at the end of the day what what's the percentage 95 percent of goods are are made in the far east not even counting italy and and so yeah i think at nordstrom you know uh, and it's mostly a foreign customer too it's mostly like european the european customer is very sensitive to made in china for for the europeans made in china is it's, it's a statement of poor quality. Um, not so much for the American consumer and, and, and also less so for the Eastern European customer. So another question. Yeah. How did you change the uh, sourcing strategy for this claim and how do you see the future? Because you said, you know, Well, the biggest thing that I did was recognize that, that our sourcing group was no longer competitive and I outsourced it to Li and Fung. And, but, that, but that didn't change our manufacturing strategy because Lee and Fung doesn't manufacture, they just manage the factories. So moving to them was a very important step, I thought, for better professional management of the factories. But there are other things that, that, that we are looking at. I mean, for our MEX business, we qualified a number of vendors in Turkey in an EU friendly, ter tariff friendly zone, but also so that we could actually get 30 to 40 percent of our product line moving from sketch to shelf in 12 weeks rather than 52. For the, for the American market, um, uh, we've done a lot more in Western Hemisphere. So we, we've qualified a number of vendors in Peru for knits that, that have allowed us faster cycle times at competitive pricing, FOBs similar to China. Um, but nothing that I would call revolutionary. These are all things that we're all doing. That's kind of the, your, your sourcing strategy is super elastic. It constantly changes in this industry. Well, we've been, in the last two years, we opted, I got very worried a year ago when all this madness began that we were headed for some trade wars with China. And you've seen crazy stuff happen. A few little things here and there with the Obama administration that have indicated a highly protectionist tone that could escalate and be a big problem for us. The move to Li and Fong was about getting us, ironically, to be able to have a vendor base that was 
more non-China than, than current because Lee and Fung actually is, they've got 44 global offices and our office was in Hong Kong and it was very focused on South China. So percentage wise, I think that we are down to 30% from actually the mainland of China and the rest from other parts of the world, which is really good, I think. It just depends on, I want to not say anything dogmatic because it depends on the business and where the technology is. You know, for this character of our business now, this, the, a, a very diversified portfolio works, but if I was on a much smaller business, that might not be the case. I could also have a business where, you know, where all the fabrications need to come from Italy and assembly could happen somewhere in the Far East. It just really depends on the business. Yes. Well, we, we spend not nearly enough, to tell you the truth. Um, we spend a fair amount at Juicy, almost nothing at Lucky, and Lucky Brand really needs a lot of advertising. It's a great brand, there's a great story, there's a truth that needs to be told there. Um, Kate Spade has a medium-sized marketing budget. Liz Claiborne has a medium-sized marketing budget. Th this is one of the traps, this is one of the cycles of doom that we all find ourselves in. You know, in a bad economy like this, it's one of the things that we cut. And yet, it is incredibly important because it, this is still a pretty ethereal business. And you create demand by showing the consumer images of product, and that stimulates the idea to go to the store and buy it or look at it. You know, consumers are still item hunters. So the answer is, my strategy for the corporation is to, over time, invest significantly more in marketing and the marketing capability because we're getting, we are making our brands big global lifestyle brands. More product categories, richer in multiple channel, and, and that means, and, and more physical retail stores, and that requires having our own stores. So I think that as we navigate through this, we're being careful, but I think that we will become a bigger spender in marketing. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we're, we're getting, we're hearing from the floor that we're getting as many 18 to 34 year olds as we are 35 plus. The problem is we, our distribution strategy isn't working hard enough. She doesn't frequent that part of the store. So we're thinking through different alternative distribution strategies because that 18 to 34 year old just isn't at Macy's in that department. She's in a completely different part of Macy's. And she's not trudging her way through the Missy department per se. I mean, that's a classic, traditional, up age consumer where we find our product. Yeah. Well, we're, it, it's one of the conundrums of this relaunch. We've got great product. It's blown up all over the blogosphere. The editorial community loves it. Consumers are saying crazy, outrageous things, and yet the distribution strategy right now doesn't add up. So stay tuned. We have more ideas coming. That could be the next step. Up there? Yeah. Well, almost all of it's in the department store's hands. Yeah, and, and they buy it how they need it. And that model's getting really stressed right now. I mean, you know, I always say Nordstrom's the last great ship afloat because they really are still true merchants there. In a lot of the other department stores, they're not really merchants anymore. They're landlords, and it's tough. And that said, department stores reach a consumer base that you could never afford to reach on your own. So it's important to have good partnerships, but to the extent that I think that, you know, our best partnerships are, I mean, are frankly with Pennies and Kohl's, where we actually vertically integrate with them and we profit share rather than we don't have a traditional wholesale model. It's a very interesting model and I think it's something that is probably going to change in the industry. But, but I mean, they, it's their store. They control it. They come into a showroom and they assort it and they buy it. And, and then they try to hold you liable for the performance of it, which is part of the whole problem that we're all in in this industry. 
it's tough. I w my first job out of college in between undergrad and graduate school was Macy's. It was a division called Lazarus in, in Ohio, and I ran their men's, women's, and kids' shoe, shoe departments in their largest store at Castleton, Indiana. And uh, I mean, I've been shocked at how the business hasn't changed since then. That was 1985? Yeah. Kind of wild. Yes? Well, what, I'm very comfortable with what's going on at Lane Crawford. Some of their other partners might not be. What we're actually making out from it, what Lane Crawford is doing, it's kind of like my answer to the question of what's going to change in this economy. Um, Lane Crawford had to make choices. They, had, they were probably spread a little too far. They had opened a lot of their own stores, and they had licensed a lot of other brands like Marc Jacobs and, um, oh gosh, what else did they have? They had four or five other big companies. And what they've done is they're going through and consolidating. But in, a, in essence, they just redid their contract with us and took up their, their guarantees and commitments. So, I mean, that's just it. You've got you to gotta go through every license agreement. You've got to make sure that all your partners are strong and that you're a priority with your partners. And we've made a lot of changes. We've made a lot of changes. That's what you have to do. That's the ever, yeah, one last question we'll take. You know, I, I think that that is one of those critical voices that's always out there. I think that, that, that you always hear that nothing new is being done. And it's, I, it's just not true. It's just not true. Um, I probably can't give you the best critical view of what, you know, just took place in Milan and London and New York in terms of the shows. Um, um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not my eye. Um, I, I only know what I read and what I hear. And, uh, you know, they're... they're their contemporary is still hot, and there's some newness going on there. Um, but you, I, think you, I think you hear it perennially that, quote, nothing new is going on in fashion, which is kind of funny because it is an inspiration-driven business. There's always a huge amount of history in it, just by, by definition. I'm actually against the Design Piracy uh, Prohibition Act that the, um, that the CFDA has proposed because I actually believe that all design comes from someplace that there's a predicate for, for all design, um, you know? Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>